Hey friends, it's Tomer, and in this video, I'm going to be covering 25 Commander decks that are $25 or less. 21 of these decks are at $25, and the last 4 decks are only $10 each. You can find all the full deck lists in the video description. All the prices are based on our sponsor, Card Kingdom. So if you want to purchase all these decks over at our sponsor, you can head on over to cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. But just keep in mind that prices are going to vary based on where you're buying your cards and also based on when you're buying the cards. So we're going to begin with the first deck, and that is Hamza, Guardian of Arashan. This is a super sweet Selesnya Go Wide plus one plus one counter deck. Our commander Hamza is a huge ramp engine in the deck. It has creature spells cost one less to cast for each creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it. And also casting Hamza costs one less to cast for each creature we control with a plus one plus one counter on it. So the game plan is very simple. We're going to just play a bunch of creatures that either put plus one plus one counters on themselves or put plus one plus one counters on other creatures. So early game we're playing cards like Luminic Arm Aspirant, Good Fortune Unicorn, and Conclave Mentor. All of these either put counters on our creatures very mana efficiently or add additional counters on our creatures like Conclave Mentor. And these cards not only pump up our creatures but they also act as ramp in the deck because they allow us to cast Hamza earlier. And then when Hamza's on the battlefield, substitute uh, creature spells that we cast are going to be costing way less mana to cast. Now Hamza isn't the only way that we're going to be utilizing plus one plus one counters. Absent Falconer is going to give all of our creatures flying, Kutzil is going to let us draw a bunch of extra cards, Inspiring Call is going to protect our entire board but also draw us a lot of cards in the process. We also have plenty of cards that utilize Hamza's incredibly powerful mana discount as well. The Warhammer Tyranids are absolutely fantastic in this deck. They all come with plus one plus one counters on them, but when Hamza's on the battlefield, we can easily trigger their Ravenous of uh, X equals five or more to draw cards as we're casting them, and a lot of them are just incredibly powerful in Hamza. We can also utilize the Warhammer mechanic uh, squad too to just play a bunch of extra dudes whenever we're casting like Space Marine Devastator. So we're not just blowing up one artifact or enchantment and making a three three, but we can have an entire squadron of them uh, just devastating our opponents. And then also colorless creatures like Artisan of Kozilek get incredibly powerful with Hamza because we can cast it for as little as zero mana. We can cast Artisan for, of Kozilek for free in this deck. So this is my personal favorite Selesnya deck currently. I absolutely love just building a board state of plus one plus one counter creatures and then utilizing that as a ramp to ramp out our commander and then subsequently ramp out huge powerful game winning creatures. The deck is super fun. It's a little bit vulnerable to uh, board wipes obviously because it's a creature heavy deck and it's a creature synergy deck uh, but we're running a lot of ways to mass protect the board and uh, yeah it just crushes faces very easily. Next we've got Legolas Master Archer. This is basically Voltron Mono Green Control, aka all your opponent's creatures are going to be dying a lot. This deck is kind of mean, so make sure that you're using this at a playgroup that is chill with you basically just machine gunning down all your opponent's creatures. Uh, it's very, very effective though at what it's doing. It has a very simple game plan, but it's, it's very powerful at doing so. So our commander is what the entire deck is built around. Um, basically, whenever you're targeting Legolas with a spell, uh, you put a plus one plus one counter on Legolas, and then whenever you cast a spell that targets a creature you don't control, Legolas deals damage equal to its power to up to one target creature. So you target Legolas, you grow Legolas. You target get one of your opponent's creatures um, and then Legolas gets to shoot down any creature that any of your opponents control. So to utilize Legolas, the core of the deck is just cheap spells that target either Legolas or something our opponents control. Something like Charge Through can either put a plus one plus one counter on Legolas and draw a card or you could target one of your opponent's creatures, uh, draw a card when the spell resolves, but more importantly, Legolas is gonna shoot down a creature your opponent's control. You don't have to shoot down the thing that you're targeting with charge through, and in fact, you don't want to because then it will fizzle out the spell and you won't get to draw a card. Uh, you can target something you don't want to kill and then use Legolas to kill the thing you want to be killing. So charge through, irresistible prey, all these type of cards are gonna be the core of the deck. And then like Whip Silk is gonna be the absolute best card in the entire deck because you can just keep 
uh, casting and recasting Whip Silk, returning it back to your hand and uh, triggering Legolas over and over again, either growing Legolas uh, repeatedly or just killing opponent's creatures repeatedly too. The entire deck is built around having Legolas on the battlefield, so the deck is filled with cantrips and card draw and removal spells, but the most important cards in the entire deck are actually going to be the protection spells. So Gaia's Gifts, Royal Treatment, Withstand Death, anything that can cheaply and effectively keep Legolas on the battlefield are going to be essential to make this deck run. There's also some really cool synergy pieces in the deck to really bring it over to the next level. Uh, Season of Growth is going to draw us a ton of cards as we're going to be targeting Legolas. Wild Defiance is also going to pump up Legolas incredibly mana efficiently in this deck. Once we've reached the mid to late game and we have a bunch of forests on the battlefield, Mirkwood Channeler can pump up Legolas and we can just start killing opponents if they're still alive for some reason. Like I said, the deck is very straightforward and very mean in a way. It's Voltron, but it's also like destroy opponents creatures dot deck. So you are going to be arch enemy at the table. That's something you need to acknowledge and have your play group cool with but in the right play group the ones that are like mid to high power and don't mind having a commander that machine gun downs creatures all the time uh, Legolas is going to overperform uh, very very likely it's based on my Gargos deck that I had a long time ago uh, and I think Legolas is just overall a little bit better than what Gargos is trying to be doing just because it's three mana instead of like six mana next, next we've got the council of four this is Azorius control that focuses on token making and drawing an absurd amount of cards. We're going to draw an extra card whenever a player draws their second card during their turn. Uh, that's including ourselves, but also whenever, whenever our opponents are drawing their second card on their turn. And then also whenever a player casts their second spell during their turn, uh, we get to make a 2-2 white knight creature token. Um, so if you've never seen the Council of Four uh, actually play out, it's kind of obscene. It draws an absurd amount of cards every Every single turn cycle and also makes an absurd amounts of night creature tokens every single turn cycle it really quickly overwhelms the table with card advantage and just tokens in a couple turns the cutest cards in the deck are the ones that help our opponents draw their second card each turn these can help us draw our second card each turn so we can draw a card on our own turn, but they can also be used on our opponent's turn so they can draw their second card each turn and then we get to draw another card as well too. And then obviously the more cards our opponents are drawing, the more spells they can be potentially casting each turn, which means we're more likely to be making knight tokens. So Quain, Lore Broker, and Curse of Verbosity, all of these can make us ensure that we're drawing our second card each turn and also our opponents are as well. Then we have a bunch of cards that utilize the fact that we're drawing so many extra cards per turn. The Council of Four is a draw a second card trigger, and we have a bunch of other cards that do the exact same thing. So Detective of the Month, uh, when we draw our second card, we make a token. Prince Imra Hill, we also make a token. And Ethereal Investigator, we also make a token. So we can really flood the board with tokens very, very quickly in a couple turn cycles and have a game-winning army. Then finally, to win the game, uh, we make a bunch of knights, so Voldelian, a uh, wave knight, can pump up our team very, very quickly. Herald of Hoofbeats gives all of our knights horsemanship, so basically unblockable. And then we have game-winning anthems like Knowledge is Power, which can give our team like plus five, plus five, very, very easily in the mid to late game because we draw so many cards each turn. So the entire deck is loaded with uh, removal, control pieces, counter magic, all that good stuff. But at the same time, we're going to be deploying a huge board state thanks to our commander and other uh, token generators. And then we just overwhelm the board very, very easily. This is like low key, one of the strongest uh, low budget commanders because it looks very unassuming, at least at first, if people aren't very familiar with the Council of Four, but it can so quickly take over the game. Next up, we've got a new commander. This is Teza Opulent Oligarch. Uh, this is a really cool tokens commander that focuses on ping abilities and life loss uh, to generate a huge board state of clues and spirits. At the beginning of our end step, we investigate for each opponent who lost life this turn, and whenever a clue we control is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, we create a 1-1 white and black spirit creature token with flying. 
So the goal of the deck is to put down Taza and then make sure all of our opponents are losing at least one life on our turn so we can make the maximum amount of clue tokens. And then we utilize our clue tokens either to draw cards or other certain abilities uh, to make a bunch of spirit creature tokens that have flying and then they can attack and deal even more damage and we make more clues and our opponents just eventually die. So the most important cards in the deck are the ones that are very efficient at making our opponents lose life. We can sacrifice clues to Dreg Recycler to make everybody lose life, drain one. Uh, Loyal Subordinate makes everybody lose three life if we have Taza on the battlefield. And then extort spells like Basilica Screecher for one additional mana whenever we're casting a spell. Uh, we make everybody get drained by one, we gain three. And that makes sure that Taza is going to give us uh, the maximum amount of clue tokens every single turn. Then when we have a whole bunch of tokens on the battlefield, we're going to utilize them a lot of really cool ways. So Rite of Oblivion, we can sacrifice a clue or a spirit or whatever to exile a non-line permanent. It's incredibly powerful and flexible. Treasure's Greed, uh, we can sacrifice a spirit after it has attacked and dealt damage to draw three cards and have each opponent lose three life and then we gain three life, again, triggering Taza very, very well. And then we could also turn the clue tokens into insane ramp with inspiring statuary. We don't have that many artifact spells in our deck, uh, so we could just tap down our clues to cast all of our non-artifact spells. It's incredibly powerful. And then to win the game, we're basically just trying to drain out our opponents. We're hitting people in the air with our spear tokens and that adds up, but our drain effects like Nadir's Nightblade and Mirkwood Bats are going to just kill our opponents very, very quickly as soon as they're on the battlefield. The cutest way to kill our opponents, though, is the new card Persuasive Interrogators. We have a lot of clues that are going to be on the battlefield if Tesa is going to stick around, and we have a lot of ways of just like mass sacrificing all of our clues if we want to. So if we have like five clue tokens on the battlefield, we drop down in the interrogators, one person is going to just die to 10 poison encounters. And we can do that multiple times if the interrogator sticks around and we have enough clues. So this deck is super sweet. It's pretty reliant on having Tesa on the battlefield because she is our primary source of making tokens and a lot of our cards care about those tokens. But we're running like a billion different ways to either protect Tesa to make sure she doesn't die or just reanimate her. The, this deck is so good at just reanimating Tesa or protecting her. It shouldn't be a problem. Next up, we have another new commander. This is Nelly Borka, Impulsive Accuser. This is a Boros Goad deck, and it's actually the face commander of a precon. And I actually had a lot of issues with the precon, and I found that I can make a much better version of Nelly Borka for half the price because you know most precons are about fifty bucks. Uh, I can make a twenty-five dollar version of Nelly Borka that is much much stronger. The main issue that I had with the precon was it was incredibly light on interaction. Like if your opponents just are doing stuff that you cannot go your way out of uh, you kind of lose the game so I fixed that and I fixed a lot of like the goat packaging and the card advantage and especially the ramp and it's just a lot stronger at $25 so Nelly's gimmick is that whenever she attacks you suspect a creature and then you goad all suspected creatures so the more of your opponent's creatures are uh, suspected the more she can be goading and then whenever one or more creatures an opponent controls deals combat damage to one or more of your opponents you and the controller of those creatures creatures each draw a card. So your opponent's creatures don't even have to be goaded for you to trigger this ability. Uh, your opponents are generally speaking wanting to draw cards. So often you'll see your opponents willingly hitting each other in order to draw cards for themselves and also for you. So this is a great way of indirectly dealing damage to your opponents and also saving your own life total in the process. Of course, your opponents are drawing cards, but you're drawing cards as well too. And you're going to have better ways of utilizing that card draw as well. So the goal of the deck is to make your opponents kill themselves for you. And we have a lot of different ways of doing so. The primary way is going to be, of course, goading. So Nelly Borka goads when she attacks. Gloin and Shiny Impetus are both ways to force your opponents to attack each other with goad, but also generate a ramp with treasure tokens, which is really good. And then we have other non-goad ways of forcing your opponents to attack each other, or at least not attack you. Noble Heritage can pump up Nelly Borka, but also if your opponents want to get those sweet plus one plus one counters, 
counters on them, um, they can't attack you or deal damage to you uh, for that turn. Now, some commander decks aren't focused on creatures at all, but you still want them to be attacking to utilize Nelly Borka's abilities. So we have a bunch of cards that actually give our opponents creatures, which we can then goad and force to attack. So Ox Drover is a really cool one. It's card advantage for us, and then weird Ox creature tokens that don't really affect us for our opponents. Hunted Dragon is a 6-6 flying uh, haster that's really, really good damage in the air. And then it gives um, some creatures to a target we uh, choose. And then Right of the Raging Storm is also fantastic. It just gives everybody a 5-1 to immediately smash with. It's great. Then we have some big beaters to close out the game. Gisela uh, doubles the damage output to our opponents and halves the damage output to ourselves. Just by Gisela on the battlefield herself swinging in the air, that's just 10 damage all by her lonesome. Um, and then Havoc Eater is mass goad, but also grows into a huge flying beater. And then a really cool new inclusion is Hot Pursuit. Um, the main issue with Goad is it doesn't do anything when we are in a 1v1 situation because you, your opponents don't have another opponent to be attacking, so the Goad ability doesn't work and they just attack you and you die. Uh, Hot Pursuit, though, says that at the beginning of combat on your turn, um, if two or more players have lost the game, you just gain control of all the goaded or suspected creatures and then you get to smash face with them. So you just yoink all the goaded, goaded creatures when it's 1v1 and then just kill your opponents with their own creatures, which is very funny. So, so I won't say that this is the strongest budget Boros deck. Um, it's definitely not even the strongest budget Boros deck in this video. There's going to be two more that are even stronger. But I will say this is my favorite budget Boros deck currently. I really love the goad mechanic. I really love the political aspect of this deck. And I love that it can go kind of under the radar as well too, because People aren't always going to be killing Nelly Borka, not focusing her down. They want to be drawing cards, and that benefits you immensely. You're going to be drawing cards, and you're also going to be having your opponents kill each other. So I really love the play style of this deck. Next, we've got Valduk, Keeper of the Flame. This is mono red equipment, and it's all in on the commander, essentially. It's either go big or go home. That's the motto. Valdic says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, for each aura and equipment attached to Valdic, create a 3-1 red elemental creature token with trample and haste. Exile those tokens at the beginning of the next end step. So for every single aura and equipment on Valduk, at the beginning of your combat, you make a 3-1 red elemental creature token. So if you have like five auras and or equipments on Valduk, that's five 3-1 elemental creature tokens swinging in. And that's 15 extra damage on combat. It's wild. So my version of Valduk is basically an equipment deck with a couple of the best auras as well too. And the main focus is mana efficient ways of equipping Valduk. So cards that cost very little mana to cast and equip are gonna be the premium ones for Valduk. So Bonesaw costs zero mana to cast, only one mana to equip. Cliffhaven Kite Sail is one of many equipments that cost very little mana, and when they enter the battlefield, they automatically attach themselves to Valduk, which is really good. And then, and then other really cheap equip uh, costs like Leather Armor, just one mana to cast, and then zero to equip. These are gonna be the best options for Valduk because we can just unload our hands of all these really cheap equipment and immediately equip them over onto Valduk. We're also utilizing the elemental tokens we're making in a lot of different ways. So we can be drawing cards by sacrificing them before they get exiled with the man answers. We can use them as one mana uh, removal spells without number. If we have like a bunch of elementals being created, we can take out pretty big creatures for just one mana at instant speed. But my favorite new card for the deck is connecting the dots. This deck unloads its hand very, very quickly and attacks with a lot of creatures very, very quickly. So Connecting the dots can be played pretty early, and then we can generate a huge amount of card advantage, dump our hand, and then refill it immediately with connecting the dots uh, on a subsequent turn, and it's just incredibly powerful. Finally, to win the game, we're just basically bashing face with our elemental creatures and Valduk, but if that's not enough for you, uh, we have a couple pump abilities that really just 
allow us to win games out of nowhere. Tears of Rage is absolutely fantastic. Uh, all our creatures get plus X plus O, where X is the number of attacking creatures. So if we're attacking with like six elementals or whatever, they all get plus six plus O until end of turn. And we don't care about the fact that they get sacrificed at end step because they're getting exiled anyway. And like the coolest aura in the entire deck is mob mentality. It gives our creature that is uh, enchanted, which is going to be Valduk, trample, and then plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is the number of attacking creatures if we just swing with everything which we plan on doing. So that's like the biggest bang for your buck in the entire uh, deck. And then Valduk is a very all or nothing uh, deck. If people are killing Valduk, uh, then we don't really get to do anything. But there are two cards that kind of allow us to recover out of nowhere uh, if Valduk gets shut down too much. The first one is Gold Warden's Gambit, which makes a bunch of rebel tokens and they all have haste and they can immediately attack. And that usually ends the game. And we also have one other one that has dwarves. Uh, it's cheaper um, and still very good, but it doesn't give them haste, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, uh, but both of those are ways of closing out the game if we cannot play Valduk anymore. This deck is only $19 because you don't really need anything other than basic mountains for the land base. Um, it's very all in on Valduk. Valduk is very, very powerful, but if you're in a meta that has a lot of interaction and they know to just kill Valduk, well, you're in mono red, so you have limited options to actually protect him, which is kind of a bummer. But there are a couple backup planes. There's some backup creatures that work very well with the same equipment package. And we do have Reckless Clue um, and Gold Warden's Gambit to win the game out of nowhere as well. But yeah, it's pretty much all or nothing. If Valdi gets shut down immediately, then you're in trouble. There are some backup plans, but for the most part, don't run this in interaction heavy decks or, or do and hope for the best. Next up, we have Etrada Deadly Fugitive. This is the Mirror Assassins with a very powerful theft and face down creatures matters sub theme going on. It's incredibly powerful and very cool. And I honestly didn't think about this commander at all until I saw it very recently on my stream being played by one of the guests on the stream. So shout out to Will for this awesome deck. I was really impressed by it. So impressed by it that I decided to do a budget brew of my own and add it to this video. So Trotta says, whenever an assassin you control deals combat damage to an opponent, you cloak the top card of that player's library and face down creatures you control have pay four mana to uh, blue and a black turn this creature face up if you can't exile it then you may cast the exile card without paying its mana cost so no matter what you hit off your opponent's uh, deck uh, you will always be able to get the value off of it you can turn it face up and if it's like a land or a permanent or whatever a creature uh, you just turn it face up and if it's an instant or sorcery uh, you exile it and just cast it for free so the idea of this deck is to just attack with a bunch of assassins generate a ton of card advantage off your opponent's decks and then either flip them up or sacrifice them for additional value so the core of the deck is obviously assassins, uh, the ones that have evasion or at the very least death touch and cost one to two mana are the premium in the deck. Uh, even Changeling Outcast is actually the best assassin in the entire deck, despite not you know actually being an assassin. It's just technically an assassin because it can't be blocked and it's just one mana. But like one mana death touchers are also absolutely fine too because your opponents, generally speaking, don't want to be trading uh, for your hired poisoner and then just flying or any sort of evasion like that. That is going to be great as well. So the idea is just play a bunch of assassins, drop down Etrada, generate a lot of card advantage off those assassins, and then go from there. Now we're going to have a bunch of cloaked creatures, but it's a lot of mana to actually flip them up. Four mana is quite a bit. So we have a couple ways of cheating uh, the flip cost, and they're kind of cheeky. The best one is Ghostly Flicker. We can flicker two uh, face down creatures and then return them back onto the battlefield under our control. And that's the key part under our control. Most of these flicker abilities uh, return them back to the owner's control, but Ghostly Flicker and Minildor Swift Savior keep them on our side of the battlefield. So instead of paying four mana to flip something face up, we we can flicker it with Minelder and Ghostly Flicker and save a lot of mana in that regard. Also, Omen Hawker is randomly incredibly powerful in this deck. It's a, basically a second Sol Ring uh, with all 
Bolt Etrata because it's a one mana spell that taps for two mana and we can use that to turn face down creatures face up which is very cool and the deck has other really cool tricks like we're an assassin deck so any assassin typo type payoff cards like this and melody are going to be fantastic in the deck uh ramsey's assassin uh lord is probably the coolest card in the entire deck because not only does it pump our uh, other assassins is the assassin itself but also if we randomly like make a player lose the game by hitting them for an assassin we just straight up win the game which is very very cool and then we also have ways of putting stuff on top of our opponent's library so we know what we're going to be hitting we're also always going to be hitting something we really want like expel from a we just bounce something uh that we really like uh onto the top of their library and then hit them with an assassin and we get to cloak it and that's that's really cool so yeah this deck is low to the ground it generates an absurd amount of card advantage it's all about assassins and it has a lot of really unique and cute tricks that i really really love uh it's very straightforward in the game plan but it has a lot of cool uh decision making based on what you're stealing off your opponents Next is another new commander. This is Three Dog Galaxy News DJ from the Fallout set. And this is Boros Auras. It's a very cute twist on Auras, actually. It says, whenever you attack, you may pay two mana and sacrifice an aura attached to Three Dog. When you sacrifice an aura this way, for each other attacking creature you control, create a token that's a copy of the aura attached to that creature. So this is Auras, but it's also go wide attacking Auras. We want to have a bunch of creatures on the battlefield. We want to put Put an aura on three dog then when we move to attackers we attack with the entire team sacrifice the aura that's attached to three dog and make a copy of that aura onto all of our other attacking creatures now the best auras in the deck are mostly just ones that have powerful enter the battlefield triggers because we're going to get a ton of extra triggers off those auras when we sacrifice it on three dog and put them on our attacking creatures so like chains of custody is going to be insane removal in the deck and also protects the uh, attacking creatures with ward two sage's reverie is going to be obscene you're going to be drawing like half your deck uh, with sage's reverie and a bunch of creatures on the battlefield and then there's a couple cards that uh don't have into the battlefield triggers but nonetheless are going be incredibly powerful here like sticky fingers it gives our attacking creatures uh menace the entire board menace and generates a bunch of treasure tokens if we do the trick with three dog and then when the creature even dies we get to draw cards which is extra value and this is an aura deck so we have plenty of aura support cards every single time uh an aura enters the battlefield we're going to be making uh pegasi with uh archon of sun's grace we can make our aura spells cost cheaper with uh hero of Iroas, and we can draw cards off our aura with SRAM Senior Edificer. So to win the game, we have a bunch of just really powerful aura support pieces like Mantle of the Ancients. You can get back all the auras if they get uh, destroyed or milled or whatever. Sigil of the Empty Throne is just going to make a huge 4-4 angel army. And all of our enchanted creatures are considered modified. So if we attack with a whole bunch of them, Aki Battle Squad is going to give us an extra combat uh, step. And we get to smash face yet again. So the nice thing about Three Dong is unlike a lot of these decks, it's not all in on our commander. Our commander is very, very powerful, but he only needs to use his ability like once or twice in the game to really justify him being in the command zone. Uh, auras are such a well-supported theme, especially in white, that we have so many support pieces, so much redundancy, that we're not actually all in on Three Dog. We can function very very well without him it's just when he's on the battlefield the deck kind of just pops off and, and goes really really hard but yeah it's a very well-rounded deck it has lots of interaction recursion protection all that good stuff and it also smashes face incredibly easily next we've got Zimone and Dina this is a Saltai deck that is half aristocrats and half uh landfall so Zimone and Dina says, whenever you draw your second card each turn, target opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So we want to be drawing at least two cards every single turn. And then we can tap it, sacrifice another creature, draw a card. You may put a lane from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. And if you control eight or more lands, you repeat this process. So yeah, we get to immediately draw two cards and put two lands on the battlefield once we have eight or more lands on the battlefield. 
incredibly powerful. This is absurdly strong for just three mana. So this deck is all about sacrificing creatures, ramping very heavily, drawing tons of cards, and draining our opponents in the process. So this deck is loaded with sacrifice fodder, things that are very happy to be sacrifices as a moment's incredibly powerful ability. The Emissary will ramp us heavily. Chasm Skulker is going to uh, get immensely huge as we're drawing a ton of cards in this deck. This is like card draw dot deck. And when we sacrifice the Skulker, we make a huge army of 1-1 Island Walk creatures that we can then subsequently keep sacrificing the Zimon or just take out anybody who has islands, unfortunately. Um, also, like Evoke creatures are really good too. You can uh, play Shriek Moth, for example, for its Evoke cost. And while its Evoke triggers on the stack before it gets sacrificed, you sacrifice it to Zimon and Dina instead. Zimon's ability is so powerful that we want a bunch of cards that will also just allow her to use her ability more than once per turn cycle, a bunch of untapped uh, cards. The very best one in the entire deck is obviously Retreat to Coral Helm. Uh, we can uh, use Retreat to Coral Helm to untap Zimone and Dina, and then we could activate Zimone and Dina's ability to sacrifice another creature, ramp out another land, trigger Retreat to Coral Helm, and untap Zimone and Dina again. So basically, as long as we have creatures to sacrifice, we can just keep activating Zimone and Dina over and over again to keep drawing cards and ramping out lands. And we have other untappers as well too. Quirion Rangers is, is fantastic in the deck and also Merkfin Liege untaps all of our creatures including Zimone and Dina. And then finally to win the game, uh, we can go wide with tokens. So Jorial Munvuli Recluse is going to be uh, generating a bunch of cat creature tokens for us and also doubles as an anthem effect. We can easily play that six mana to give all creatures like a billion a plus a billion because we're going to have infinite cards in our hand at any given time. Rampaging Balos every single time we're ramping, we're making four four beasties. And then if we don't want to just smash face with combat, we can just drain out our opponents as well too with Psychosis Crawler because we're going to be drawing all all the cards. So this deck is utterly bananas, even at $25. It's like ramp and draw dot deck. Everything that is in the deck is just utilizing all that incredible ramp and draw potential in the deck. It doesn't even matter if Zimone and Dina die like 50 different times because we're going to have so much mana that we could just recast it infinite times. And we have, we're in black, so we have insane recursion and we have counter magic and actual protection as well too if we don't want them to die. Uh, yeah, the deck is just really strong. It's really strong at $25. Next, we have Agnes the Dragon's Lash. This is Jund, Haste Matters, and Treasures Matters. So this is a pretty relatively simple creature. Uh, it has haste, and whenever a creature you control with haste attacks, create a tapped treasure token. That's surprisingly low word count for uh, 2024 standards. But even with a relatively low word count and even flavor text in there, uh, it's incredibly powerful. So the goal of the deck is to basically play a bunch of hasty creatures, make a ton of treasure tokens, and then utilize those treasure tokens not just to ramp out even more creatures, but uh, also win the game various ways. So a lot of the deck is just focused on hasty creatures. We have cheap evasive creatures like Phoenix Chick is like one of the best one drops in the entire uh, deck. It's flying in haste. That's awesome. Um, the Balrag Durin's Bane is also very awesome too. We can like sacrifice a whole bunch of treasures on a single turn and then cast the Balrog for as little as two mana and it has haste and it does extra things it's super powerful or we could turn all of our uh, lands into hasty indestructible vigilance creatures with Kamal's will and make just a whole bunch of treasures all at once which is super fun then when we have a whole bunch of treasures, we're going to be sacrificing them obviously to generate mana, but we're going to be utilizing a bunch of cards to get even more value out of our treasures. So Jury is going to get huge, and then when it dies, uh, we get to basically one-shot an opponent if if uh, we have a Jury big enough. Idol of Oblivion, we're going to be drawing cards as we're making treasures, and as we're sacrificing treasures, we get to put a bunch of oil counters on Vat of Rebirth and just keep basically reanimating stuff super, super mana efficiently. And then finally, to win the game, we have a bunch of different ways of doing so. Uh, we have the good old drain effects like Mirkwood Bats and Nadir's Nightblade. So when we're sacrificing our treasures for value, uh, we're just draining out our opponents. And we can also just like steal all of our opponent's creatures as well too with Mob Rule. Uh, this is like a mini insurrection effect. And, you know, they all have haste too. So Agnes is going to also generate a ton of treasures as we're removing blockers and killing our opponents with their own creatures. So the deck is 
incredibly straightforward, but also incredibly powerful. Like, Agnes is just a huge treasure generator, and treasures are a busted mechanic, so this deck is fairly busted if Agnes is allowed to stick around on the battlefield. So if you like aggro, if you like haste, if you like smashing face, uh, this might be the deck for you. Next, we have arguably the strongest Boros budget deck and one of the strongest budget decks in general. It's, of course, Winota Joiner of Forces. This is a CDH deck that is still punching people in the face super, super hard, even at $25. Winota says, whenever a non-human creature you control attacks, look at the top six cards of your library. You may put a human creature card from among them onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. It gains indestructible until end of turn. Put the rest of the cards on the bottom of your library in a random order. So the goal of the deck is just basically play Winota, attack with non-human creatures, and then put humans from our library directly onto the battlefield, attacking and smashing face for huge, huge damage. So the first couple turns of the deck, uh, we just want to play some non-human creatures that are very mana efficient. Ornithopter costs zero mana, Phoenix Chick costs only one mana, and Cranker's Command for two mana, we put two non-humans on the battlefield that can attack, and that means two Winota triggers when Winota's on the battlefield. And then when Winota is on the battlefield, we attack with our non-humans, and we get to put down some incredibly powerful human haymakers directly from our library onto the battlefield. So Theoden gives a bunch of our creatures double strike, why not? Eomer enters the battlefield as a huge double strike creature that also blows up uh, a target and gives us the monarchy, sure. And then Lena, selfless champion, enters the battlefield as a 3-3 with two additional uh, non-human creatures that can additionally um, trigger Winota on subsequent turns. And she can also protect your most of your board at the same time if you need to so if there's a board wipe happening or an important creature is getting picked off you can sacrifice lana and give uh those creatures indestructible so winota is incredibly powerful she wins games all by herself in one to two turn cycles um so basically all we have to do is make sure winota doesn't die and winning is basically inevitable at that point. So this deck is actually loaded not only with non-human uh, creatures and human creatures, but also just a bunch of protection spells because our number one goal is just to make sure Winota sticks around. So Lauren's Escape, Selfless Savior, Unbreakable Formation, we're just running the most efficient and powerful uh, ways of protecting Winota and the rest of her board uh, to make sure we just win the game because if Winota sticks around, we win. So this deck, is very, very powerful. In fact, if you're like playing at pre-con level or even like upgraded pre-con level, maybe don't run Winota. She is very, very powerful. If you're at like a higher power table though that can handle Winota, runs like a decent amount of interaction, uh, then she is a fine option, uh, especially at $25. Um, but yeah, the, the deck is all in on Winota. Make sure to cast Winota and have like a protection spell still in hand ready to go. Otherwise, if Winota gets shut down too many times, the deck just doesn't really do that much. Next, we've got a partner pairing. This is Abdel Adrian Gorion's Ward and Candlekeep Sage, the background. And this is Azorius Blink. Abdel says whenever it enters the battlefield, exile any number of other non-land permits you control until Abdel leaves the battlefield, and you create a 1-1 white soldier creature token for each permanent exiled this way. And Candlekeep Sage says commanders you control have when this creature enters or leaves the battlefield, draw a card. So the goal of the deck is basically to just blink Abdel a whole bunch of times. You play Adel, you exile basically all your non-token permanents, uh, make a whole bunch of 1-1 soldiers in the process, and then blink Abdel, you know, uh, flicker it, uh, so all those things re-enter the battlefield, Abdel re-enters the battlefield afterwards, and then exiles all the stuff, makes even more soldier tokens, and you just keep doing that over and over again. So the stuff we want to be exiling and blinking with Abdel and other cards are stuff like Cloud of Fairies, which uh, untap our land, so it acts as a ramp in our deck. Uh, Circuit Mender, it draws a card when it leaves the battlefield and also gains us two life when it enters the battlefield. And Reality Acid, which is really, really mean removal, you put it onto an, uh, permanent your opponent's control, and then when you blink it, that enchanted permanent is then sacrificed. And then it re-enters the battlefield, enchanted onto another permanent, you blink it and that that permit also goes away so this is like the meanest and most effective uh removal spell in the entire deck and then to blink uh abdel adrian the best ones are permanents that etb blink uh so glorious protector restoration angel urian all these things can be able to blink abdel and you could also exile live with abdel um so you blink abdel 
Um, and then you flicker Abdel with another one of these type of cards. They all enter the battlefield again, and then you blink Abdel with the, their enter the battlefield trigger again, and you just keep doing this over and over again, and you make like a whole bunch of soldier tokens and win the game. And speaking of winning the game, Blink decks had this habit of just going all in on value and dirtling away to infinity, and your opponents are just left begging for death as you are just doing everything, taking up all the time in the world, and nobody can really stop you. So the most important cards in the entire deck are actually going to be the finishers. I beg you to run these cards. Ariat's Tempting a uh, Apple, ETB, Steal a Creature, uh, Valor and Akros, and Gold Knight Commander. Uh, whenever creatures enter the battlefield, all your creatures get uh, a huge pump effect. So if you like put in like five soldier tokens or something as you're flickering Abdul or whatever, uh, all your creatures get plus five, plus five, and you can go in and actually kill your opponents. And please, please just kill your opponents when you have the advantage. Don't just keep dirtling. Nobody likes that. So yeah, this deck is incredibly powerful, even at $25. You all notice though, Azorius Blink is just very, very powerful. We've seen it a billion different times, and Abdel Adrian is no exception. I really like this version though, because it can be very aggressive. Abdel Adrian makes a ton of 1-1 tokens. As soon as you start pumping those tokens, you can really end the game fairly quickly actually, which is really nice to see in Azorius Blink. All right, next we come to my favorite budget commander of all time. It's none other than Edric, Spy Master of Trust. It was one of the first budget commanders I ever wrote about, and it was the first commander I ever played on the very first episode of Commander Clash, and it was so strong that uh, the Commander Clash crew has banned it ever since. So Edric, Spy Master of Trust, it's a Simic go wide, uh, tempo deck, that's how I would call it. It's a three mana uh, creature that says whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents, its controller may draw a card. So this ability helps not just you, but your opponents. If your opponents are attacking and dealing combat damage to each other, uh, as long as they're your opponents, uh, they also get to be drawing cards as well. And that seems like a group hug thing to do, but our deck is going to be taking far more advantage of it than any of our opponents. And hey, if our opponents want to draw a couple cards while smashing each other in the face, that makes our job even easier to actually kill them. So the core of the deck are just cheap, evasive creatures. The cheaper and more evasive, the better. So Farius here, it's a one mana, one, one flyer, scry two, Siren Storm Taper, one, one flyer that also can protect Edric, which is super important. And Spyglass Siren, one, one flyer that even comes with a map token, it's awesome. So we play a bunch of these uh, cheap evasive beaters, we play Edric, and then we just start drawing an obscene amount of cards off them. To actually win the game, we're gonna be utilizing our evasive beaters a whole bunch of ways. Druid's Repository is like the best ramp engine in the entire deck. We're easily gonna be attacking with five or more uh, one ones in the air every single turn. So we're gonna be generating five or more mana off the repository. Uh, extra turn spells like Walk the Aeons. We have a bunch of creatures. We wanna draw even more cards. We wanna finish the game. Walk the Aeons is gonna be an easy way to just have an extra combat phase essentially in our deck. The blue way of taking extra combats and then we could also just pump up our one ones turn them into six fours with scale up if we want to end the game very quickly also the entire deck is reliant on edric being on the battlefield but don't worry we're in blue so we have a thousand different ways to protect edric and protect our board in general so ecr it's a flyer it costs two mana instead of one but it makes up for the fact that you can play it before you play edric and then suddenly edric essentially has ward three which is great unified will is a very efficient way of protecting the board it's like a basically a counter spell in our deck because we're all about having a lot of creatures on the battlefield and then we even have free counter magic like foil like we're gonna be drawing so many cards we're gonna easily discard an island and another card for a free counter spell at any given time so yeah the deck is oppressively strong it's also incredibly straightforward how you play you just play a bunch of evasive creatures you play edric you draw a billion cards and then you just protect your board with uh cheap protection cheap counter magic all that stuff spot removal anything that can interfere with your game plan you just get rid of it and then just draw more cards and then just crush your opponents next we have another favorite of mine another oldie but a goodie this is zada hedron grinder and this is mono red storm I will caution you that this is a very effective deck, but it is a solitaire deck. You're going to be taking like a five minute turn, the turn you pop off and win the game. 
Some playgroups do not like watching you play for five minutes by yourself. Some playgroups are okay with it. So just check out with your playgroup whether or not this is acceptable. Uh, if it's not acceptable, play Valduk. That's mono red all in uh, aggro, and the turns are much, much faster with Valduk. But if you want to have the true spice, the true storm experience, Zada is your girl. Uh, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery that targets only Zada, copy that spell for each other creature control. That spell could target. Each copy targets a different one of those creatures. So the idea is to play a bunch of creatures on the battlefield, either tokens or cheap creatures or whatever, play Zada, and then cast instant or sorceries that only target Zada. And that will copy the instant or sorcery onto all your other creatures. So you get a billion extra copies off Zada for free. So the beginning of the game is always the same. We're playing cheap creatures like Ornithopter, cheap ramp that are creatures like Iron Mirror, and then uh, just very efficient ways of putting extra bodies on the battlefield like Dragon Father, two mana, you get two uh, bodies on the battlefield. And then we play Zada and the fun begins. Uh, we can generate an obscene amount of mana off cards like Ancestor's Aid. Like if we have five creatures on the battlefield, uh, we pay two mana for Ancestor's Aid and we make five treasure tokens. And we also pump the team as well too. Um, so we're up three mana that way. We can draw all the cards with Expedite. We just, for one mana, we draw a billion cards. And then we also have cute little things that are kind of like uh, mana advantage slash untappers like Karyuzez Expertise. We use this to target not our opponent's creatures, but our but Zada, and then we get to untap all of our creatures, give them all haste, and then cast cheap spells from our hand for free. And this works exceptionally well with our mana dorks like the Iron Mirror and stuff, because we get to tap them for mana and then use Karyazev to untap them and then, you know, attack with them or whatever. And then finally, to win the game, uh, we have a bunch of very uh, mana efficient pump effects, like Fist of Flame is the MVP of the entire deck. Uh, it draws us a ton of cards and also pumps our entire team and also gives them all trample. So it's like literally the best card in the 99. Downhill Charge pumps the entire team and it costs zero mana because we could just sacrifice a mountain instead. And Kick in the Door can kill the entire table without even attacking them because uh, one of the dungeons I believe is like a drain effect. So you speed run through the dungeon a billion different times. Um, you give them all haste and plus one plus one counter. So you could just kill them with combat damage. But if somebody has like a fog effect or something, uh, you can actually just drain them to death with King of the Door, which is something I've done before. So the deck is all in on Zada. It's mono red storm. It's mono red solitaire. You're going to take five minutes to actually pull off the win. So I highly recommend just like gold fishing the deck a whole bunch. So you're familiar with how to actually pop off and what the cards do. Don't just play this uh, going blind into your play group or else they'll hate you. Uh, but yeah, you could, you could basically pull this off like within two minutes if you're very familiar with all the cards. Uh, it's super fun. It's more powerful than Valduk, but it suffers from the exact same issue as the Valduk deck is that it's all in on Zada and at a low budget at only $25 there's very few ways to actually protect Zada in mono red um, so it's very weak to heavy interaction metas but if Zada is allowed to stick around just for a single turn uh, you basically just win the game it's like an auto win so yeah you either win immediately or you get shut down and do nothing there's no in between Next, we have another partner pairing. This is Armix Filigree Thrasher and Iktakik Salvage Splicer. This is an artifact deck, but unlike most artifact decks, which are either blue, uh, red, or both, this is neither of those two colors, the primary colors of artifacts. This is Golgari artifacts. And the nice pairing here is Armix is our early game interaction piece. Whenever it's attacking, we can discard a card and then basically blow up an opposing creature. And then Eek to Keek is our late game finisher. When it enters the battlefield, it comes with a golem. And then whenever artifacts are put into the graveyard from the battlefield, we're putting plus one plus one counters on Eek to Teek and all of our other golems. So the token it comes with and Armix and other golems as well. So we got early early game interaction and late game finisher both in the command zone. So the deck is basically Golgari Artifact Aristocrats. We have a bunch of cheap cards that want to be sacrificed. Chromatic Sphere uh, sacrifices itself and draws a card. Prize Statue enters the battlefield, makes a treasure, and when it's sacrificed, we make another treasure. And Mirror Retriever, when it's sacrificed, we return an artifact card from our graveyard to our hand. So we have a bunch of cheap artifacts that want to be sacrificed for value. 
And then we run a lot of sacrifice outlets that sacrifice those cheap artifacts for even more value. Scrapyard Recombiner will get a Constar card from our library directly to our hand. Fanatical Offering draws us two cards and makes a map token, which is another artifact that we can sacrifice for more value. And Lich Knight's Conquest, we can sacrifice any number of these artifacts and get back a bunch of creature cards from the graveyard directly back to the battlefield. And as we're doing all this sacrifice stuff, if Iktaqiq's on the battlefield, then suddenly we grow our team and win the game that way. Uh, we have a bunch of other golems in the deck too. I'm only running the really good ones. I think like a lot of the golems are kind of bad, but the most noteworthy ones, uh, Geode Golem, it has Trample, so it benefits immensely from all these plus one, plus one counters with its evasion. But also whenever it deals combat damage, we can cast one of our commanders for free and casting Eat the Keek for uh, zero mana feels real good. Um, also Cradle Clear Cutter, we can play for three mana and then just grow it. Uh, with Iktaqiq and it just generates insane ramp. And then outside of just combat damage, uh, we have Agent of the Iron Throne and other drain effects too. So whenever artifacts are being uh, sacrificed or just going into the graveyard for various ways, each opponent is losing one life. And the nice thing is we have two commander creatures. So if we have Iktaqiq and Armix both on the battlefield, Agent of the Iron Throne says, all of our opponents are losing two life for each artifact going into the graveyard, which is a very quick way to kill them. So the deck is very unique. Uh, it's unlike most artifact decks because we're not in the traditional artifact colors. We get to do really cool things in black and green. And that's what I love about it so much. It's doing stuff that you typically don't get to see in the artifact archetype. And I, it's really fun. It has early interaction, a lot of card advantage, a lot of shenanigans, and then it just has built-in finishers both in the command zone and inevitability in the 99. Next, we have another old school oldie, but a goodie. And one of the first budget commanders I ever wrote about, it's Talran's Sky Summoner. So this is a mono blue control, mono blue spell slinger, and it has a token sub theme as well too. Talrand, again, from another era when there was a lot less card text on all the cards. Whenever you cast an instant sorcery spell, you put a 2-2 blue drake creature token with flying onto the battlefield, and it has even room for flavor text. Remember those? Remember those on legendary creatures? I remember. But yeah, the, the game plan is very simple. We're just going to be casting a lot of cheap instants and sorceries that can't trip or do other useful things for us. And as we're doing that, Talrand is going to be making a bunch of 2-2 Drake tokens that are going to eventually take over the game. Uh, they're either going to be blockers early on, but later on, you just start attacking with them and you win the game by just smashing face. So most of the deck is cheap cantrips and stuff, but I have a lot of spice that I've collected over the years that make it super, super fun that work very, very well with Tauran. So Cypher cards are incredibly powerful with Tauran because you cast them, you uh, exile them attached to like a Drake or whatever, and then whenever they deal combat damage, you get to cast them again. So... Each time you're casting them from exile, you're triggering Talrand and you're making another Drake. And some of them are actually very, very powerful. Like Hidden Strings, um, it untaps two target permanents. Usually that's just going to be like lands. So think of it as basically generating two mana every single time you're uh, casting it, either the first time from your hand or casting it with its Cypher ability. Uh, stolen Identity, you just make token copies of the best artifact or creature on the battlefield repeatedly while making a lot of uh, Drakes. So Cypher cards, super fun with Talran. Also casualty cards are really good with Talran too. You don't get to make two uh, Drakes when you cast uh, the casualty side of it because you're not casting the spell, you're just copying it. But even so, just being able to cast a little chat, sacrifice a Drake, and then put uh, two cards into your hand with a little bit of card selection is really good. And then you make another Drake with Talran. It's great. We also have other spice, like we can draw a whole bunch of cards very efficiently with Distant Melody once we have a couple Drakes on the battlefield. And my favorite card in the entire deck, one of my favorite cards in general, is Invasion of Segovia slash Cadis, uh, the Sea Tyrant of Segovia. You play down the battle, you immediately flip it very easily with all your evasive uh, Drake creatures. You just have to hit them with two Drakes. And then suddenly, all your non creature spells have Convoke. So all of the spells you're casting, you can tap your blue Drakes to basically cast all your spells for free. And then at the beginning of your end step, you untap up to four target creatures so you can keep convoking and have chump blockers and stuff. Oh, Cadus is so fun. Cadus is so good. I love this deck.
And then outside of the spice, we've got, you know, the usual suspects. We have counter magic. We really need to protect tower end because the deck struggles immensely without tower end on the battlefield. So counter magic is key. Uh, board wipes like spectral deluge. It only gets rid of our opponent's stuff and keeps our stuff intact, which is great. And then since we're basically draw go and we always have our mana available at any given time, stuff like pressed enemy, like these are kind of expensive bounce spells or removal spells or whatever, um, are very powerful here because we could just keep that mana up, four mana at instant speed, not a problem whatsoever. And then we get to cast an instant sorcery for free from our hand. Yeah, that's good. I like it. So yeah, the deck is very simple. We just play Talran, then play a bunch of instances of sorceries and win with Drakes inevitably. Um, just keep in mind that the deck doesn't really do too much without Talran. So don't play Talran tapped out or anything. That's bad. You play Talran like mid to late game actually. Once you have mana available to play Talran and then protect Talran as well for the inevitable targeted removal because people know that Talran's kind of scary. So always have protection is what I'm trying to say. All right, we move from mono blue to mono blue. Uh, this is a very different style of mono blue deck, though. This is Elegith, Crossroads, Augur, and Easier Wordwing Familiar. And unlike Talran, which was a control spell singer, this is not control at all. This is mono blue Voltron. The idea here is Elegith is the main commander of the deck. Um, it's a 5 6 flyer, so it's already pretty big by itself. But if you would scry a number of cards, draw that many cards instead. So we're loaded with scry spells and they just turn into straight up raw card draw with Elegith. It's very, very good. Meanwhile, ECR is the support commander. It comes out much earlier. It gives uh, both our commanders the equivalent of Ward 3, essentially, and it can be utilized in early game ramp and early game value before Elegith actually arrives on the battlefield. So the main shtick of this deck is we take scry cards that are already good, and we make them absurdly powerful when Elegith's actually on the battlefield. So cards like Preordain and Serum Visions just become Ancestral Recalls in the deck, right? Like you just draw three cards for one mana, that's good value. And Artificer's Assistant, we have a lot of historic spells in this deck, a lot of artifacts and, what, and whatnot. So Artificer's Assistant is just gonna be scrying a bajillion uh, times and AKA drawing a billion cards with Elegith on the battlefield. And then we're drawing a bunch of cards and we're going to be utilizing all that card draw to actually win the game. So Prost, Iadic Memory, Imperial Plate, and Hand of Vecna. These all basically just say, if you're drawing a lot of cards, Elegith is going to get really, really huge. And then Elegith gets to one shot or two shot people with commander damage. And then, like I said, ECR plays a very important role to the deck as well, too. It comes out on turn two. It's an evasive beater. Um, we can do stuff like Explorer Scope, Gold Vein Pick, and Goggles of Night. These are cheap equipment that we can put onto ECR, generate a lot of value before Elegith actually arrives onto the battlefield itself. The deck is straightforward and very, very powerful. And unlike most mono blue decks, it actually does win the game fairly quickly. Like turn eight or so, it's looking to one shot your opponents. And that's that's actually super fun. Next is another very powerful Boros commander. It's General Ferris Rockerick. This is a multicolor matters deck. Whenever we're casting a multicolored spell, we create a four four red and white golem artifact creature token, which is very big. Like compare that to Talran's ability where whenever we cast an into the sorcerer, we get a two two. This is a 4-4. Four four. So all by himself, he's going to be making a very scary army. So the goal of the deck is to just load up on multicolored spells, uh, cast a bunch of multicolored spells, make a huge army, smash face, all that good stuff. So thankfully, even on a budget, we have a ton of incredibly powerful multicolor spells. We have Aloran Searing Light, which acts as very, very good removal. We have Amazing Card Draw with Showdown of the Skulls. And we have also Amazing Card Draw slash Recursion with Campus of Renovation. And whenever we're casting any of these multicolored spells, with uh, Rockerick on the battlefield, we're also making a 4-4 token to smash face with. We're also utilizing the tokens in various ways, uh, mostly drawing cards. La Shield is one of the best card draw outlets in the entire deck because whenever a token enters the battlefield with Rockerick, we get to draw cards and it only triggers once each turn, but we have a lot of instant spells, uh, multicolored instant spells to trigger Rockerick and make a token at instant speed. So we can end up triggering Lo Shield multiple times per turn cycle and draw multiple cards. Then there's the old standard Idol of Oblivion. Whenever we make a token, we can draw a card by tapping it. And we can also tap all of our tokens uh, for mana with Inspiring Statuary. 
Ferrari. Then to win the game, obviously we have a bunch of 4-4s four that can kind of win the game by themselves, but we can pump them up even further with cards like Niali, Sun's Vanguard to give them double strike and oh, by the way, also draw us a ton of cards. Uh, Tori uh, gives all of them uh, plus one plus one and trample and also pseudo vigilance by untapping them. And the new one, Sarah, uh, Sentinel Sarah Lions is absolutely fantastic. It essentially gives all of our creatures plus two plus two, as long as we like made one artifact into the battlefield. And then as we swing in with the masses, uh, Sentinel Sierra Lions does a huge amount of targeted damage to any target, including a person's face. So the entire deck revolves around Rockerick, but the good news is that Rockerick comes in with some built-in Hexproof, which is really, really powerful, surprisingly powerful. And we're also in white, so we have like a thousand and one ways of actually protecting him. So the idea is just stick down Rockerick, hope he survives a couple turn cycles, make a huge army, and then keep smashing face and win the game that way. Next, we have possibly the most underrated budget brew out there. This is Verizal the Split Current. This is Simic Kicker Matters. Verizal enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on for each mana spent to cast it. So you can actually cast it for just two mana, like green, blue, and it will enter the battlefield with two counters on it. And what makes it so awesome is it also counts the command tax uh, when putting plus one plus one counters on it. So command tax recasting Verizal is actually not really a big deal at all. And whenever you cast a kicked spell, you may remove two plus one plus one counters on Verizal. And if you do copy that spell, you may choose new targets for the copy. So basically Verizal is just like a big creature that allows you to copy your kicked spell, doubling the value of all your kicked spells. So the type of spells we're going to be copying are big haymaker kicker spells like Inscription of Abundance, Inscription of Insight. Uh, these do a billion different things, add counters on Verizal, allow him to fight multiple things, gain life, um, make big illusion tokens, draw a bunch of cards, return stuff. If you resolve an Inscription of Abundance and you kick it and you have Verizal and you copy it, or an Inscription of Insight and you copy it with Verizal, you're basically winning. <laughs> you're, you're having a great time. And then other really good kick spells are like Thieving Skydiver. Instead of stealing one uh, Sol Ring with Thieving Skydiver, why not steal two Sol Rings with Thieving Skydiver and have another 2-1 uh, Flyer at the same time? So yeah, Verizal makes kick spells really, really good. Turns out copying them for a very low investment makes spells really strong. <laughs> And there's not a lot of kicker support outside of Verizal, but there are a couple notable ones. So like Roost of Drakes is the second best one. Uh, whenever we're kicking spells, we get to make 2-2 uh, two -two Drake tokens. And the best thing of all is if you kick Roost of Drakes, then you can make two of them with Verizal. And then suddenly you're flooding the board with uh, Drake tokens as you're kicking and copying spells. And we also have very efficient ramp with Elfheim Druid. It's a two drop that taps for two mana whenever we're kicking spells. And then we have like unofficial support pieces in the deck too, like Errant Street Artist. Whenever we're copying a spell with Verizal, we can pay two more mana um, to make another copy of that spell with Errant, which is really cool. And then to end the game, we have various kicked spells uh, that can kind of end the game by itself. Wolfbriar Elemental is going to make a huge number of wolf tokens. We can surprise pump uh, creatures after blockers are declared and everything to just deal a huge amount of damage with Strength of the Tajuru. Or we could put down like two 5-5 five, five creatures that immediately fight and kill opposing blockers with Territorial Allosaurus. And also Verizal itself gets really, really big very, very quickly. So yeah, the deck is super fun, very resilient to removal because we don't mind recasting Verizal. In fact, we're going to kill Verizal itself by just removing counters off it slowly but surely. So like recasting Verizal, not a big deal. And then when Verizal's on the battlefield, copying all of our kicked spells is just so much value. It's so hard for your opponents to keep up with that amount of insane value. So yeah, the deck is really strong and yet nobody has heard of Verizal basically and nobody thinks much of the card until they actually see it in action. But here is a commander that most people have heard about and it has a reputation for a reason. One of the strongest budget brews right up there with Winota actually, it's Light Paws Emperor's Voice. This is Mono White Aura Voltron. The idea here is whenever an aura enters the battlefield under your control, if you cast it, you may search your library for an aura card with mana value less than or equal to that aura and with a different name than each aura you control, put that card onto the battlefield attached to light paws, then shuffle. So basically, 
Every single aura we get to cast, we get to tutor up an aura and cast it for free with Lice Paws on the battlefield. It's absurdly strong. I can't believe they made this card this good for two mana. It is silly. So the type of auras we're getting with it, obviously we're going for a Voltron strategy. So stuff like all the glitters pumps up Light Paws immensely huge. Battle Mastery, double strikes, so double the damage, double the fun. And then we also have a ton of removal spells that act as like protection and stuff like Chains of Custody. We can cast an aura, then put Chains of Custody on Light Paws, uh, remove something on the battlefield, and then boom, Light Paws also has Ward 2 now, by the way. And then we also have a ton of aura support because uh, there's a ton of budget aura support pieces in white. So Core Spirit Dancer, whenever we're casting an aura, we get to draw a card. Uh, Starfield Mystic makes our enchantment spells cost one less to cast. And as we're putting all these auras on the battlefield, we're making a huge amount of Pegasi with Archon of Sun's Grace. So the deck is all in on light paws, but fear not, we're in white and we're in auras. So we have a thousand and one ways of protecting light paws and making our opponents miserable. Lord's Escape, one mana, make light paws really hard to kill. Uh, if light paws actually dies, we have a bunch of ways of getting it back onto the battlefield without paying uh, a hefty command tax, like unfinished business. It even comes with a couple auras as well too. And also uh, we have one-sided wraths, like Winds of Wrath uh, destroy basically everything that isn't Light Paws, anything that doesn't have an aura attached to it. So much like Winota, do not play Light Paws against basic precons or even semi-upgraded precons. It will pub stomp at like low to mid power tables. This is something you want to bring out at like a higher power table because it is incredibly overpowered. Light Paws is incredibly overpowered. You're in an archetype that is very well supported even at a budget range and you're just passively generating insane card advantage, insane protection, insane ramp, insane interaction, insane everything and one-shutting people very very easily. Um, so yeah, Light Paws very very strong. If you want like what the strongest budget brews are at $25, I would say Light Paws, Winota, maybe Zimone and Dina is very very strong too actually. But yeah, yeah. Light Paws, very, very strong. All right, we have the final $25 deck, and this one comes with the same caveat as Zada and Light Paws and Winota. This is Vadric. It's incredibly, incredibly strong. One of the strongest $25 decks you could build. This is straight up Is It Storm, and much like Zada, the entire purpose of this deck is to take a very long turn casting a bunch of spells finding your combo or storm finisher and winning the game, you're going to take two to five minutes uh, to pull it off on a given time when you're popping off. So Vadric also comes with the beloved day or night mechanic. If it's neither day nor night, it becomes day as Vadric enters the battlefield and instant and sorcery spells you cast cost X less to cast where X is Vadric's power. So starting power is one. So as soon as Vadric's on the battlefield, uh, instant and sorcery spells cost one less to cast. And then whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, you put a plus one plus one counter on Vadric. So he can even grow himself. And as the power goes up, the mana discount goes up as well too. So the number one thing you want to be doing in the deck, you want to play Vadric, and then you want to pump up his power. The sweet spot to get his power is three. You want to get him to three power so you can start having a lot of fun. So cards like Ancestor's Aid, Sudden Breakthrough, these are basically mana-free ways of getting him to three power because you pay one mana, uh, one red, to cast Ancestor's Aid or some Breakthrough when Vadric's on the battlefield because he gives a one mana discount all by himself. And he gets to three power. And then guess what? You also get a treasure token. So you basically refunded the red mana you spent to cast it. Or you can cast it for free with Blazing Shoal. Uh, you have to remove a red card from your hand, but you'll give Vadric, you know, some amount of power uh, when you cast it. And then when Vadric is at three or more power, the fun truly begins for you, not for your opponents. Uh, you get to basically cycle through your entire deck uh, with cards like Pirate's Prize, uh, Tezzeret's Gambit, Inspired Tinkering. All of these are mana-free ways of drawing through your deck to find your combo pieces to win the game. And in fact, in the case of Inspired Tinkering, you're generating three treasure tokens. So you're actually going to be up on mana when you cast the spell. And then to win the game, you need to find uh, one of your combos or just like a big mana finisher because you're going to be generating a ton of mana as you're cycling through your deck with Vadric. So one of the easiest combos is having Vadric at 
four or more power, having Runaway Steamkin on the battlefield, and then casting Searing Touch a billion times. The way it works is Searing Touch says it deals one damage to target creature or player uh, for one red mana, and it has a buyback cost that goes back to your hand if you pay four additional mana. So with Vadric at four or more power, you can pay the buyback cost for free, and you just have to pay one red mana every single time you're casting Searing Touch um, over and over again. And Runaway Steamkin allows you to pay for the red mana. Every single time you cast three red spells, you can remove the plus one, plus one counters on Steamkin and add three red mana. So you could do this infinite times for infinite damage. Alternatively, you're going to be generating so much mana with Vadric as you're cycling through the deck and making a ton of treasure tokens and casting red ritual spells and whatnot. If you hit something like Jai's Immolating Inferno, you could usually cast Jai's Immolating Inferno for like 30 or more uh, mana and just take out your opponents that way too. So the deck is insanely powerful. Unlike Zada, you're in blue, so you do have more protection options to make sure Vadric doesn't die before you get to pop off and win the game. But... The downside is that the turns are incredibly long, possibly even longer than Zada, I would say. Um, so you're gonna need five minutes or something to actually pop off and win the game. And for a lot of playgroups, they do not want to see that at least very often. So maybe this is like a one time, once in a while type deck you pull out. The good news is it's only 25 bucks, right? So if you're not playing it a lot, you still didn't spend a lot of money on it, I guess. And if you do need a budget deck for a higher power table, Vadric is going to be a very good option for that because he can stick around against um, higher power uh, groups. And yeah, uh, if he dies, you're gonna have a bad time, but you are in blue and you have more access to uh, protection spells to give you a better shot at actually winning the game. All right, so those were all my $20 to $25 decks. And now we're gonna be checking out the four remaining decks that are all $10. So the first deck is Paco and Holden. This is the first $10 deck. So basically to make $10 decks work, you're gonna have to run a lot of basic lands, like 60-ish basics uh, to make a $10 deck actually work, at least according to MTG Goldfish pricing. And there's two archetypes that can actually make that work. Either you're going to be casting non-land spells from your opponent's decks with theft decks, or you have some sort of gimmick combo deck that utilizes your commander and like one card in the 99 uh, to win the game very easily that way. So Paco and Halden are in the first category. This is a theft deck. Basically the idea is to play Paco and start swinging exiling the top card of each player's library and put a Fitch counter on each of them. And then you put a plus one plus one counter on Paco for each non-creature card exiled this way. So you're stealing cards off the top of everybody's library uh, and you're growing Paco at the same time. So it becomes a huge threat very quickly. And then Halden shows up as the card advantage engine. You It allows you to cast non-creature spells that are exiled with Paco. So the fact that most of your deck is just lands is not a problem because you're gonna be getting non-lands off your opponents. So all we wanna do is basically smash face with Paco. Paco is our win condition. Paco goes incredibly big very, very quickly. So all we gotta do is attack with Paco, keep Paco alive with various protection spells, and eventually we just run over our opponents while also utilizing their non-creature spells against them. So early game, all we wanna do is ramp. Uh, since we have so many lands in the deck, cards like Explore and Summer Bloom and Broken Bond that could put lands directly from our hand onto the battlefield are just incredibly efficient here because our hand is usually just gonna be full of land. And we can also play Hald in turn three to set up when Paco actually enters the battlefield and starts exiling non-creature spells. We can then subsequently cast them with Halden. And then the rest of the deck is just protection spells for Paco. Paco needs to live because the longer Paco's on the battlefield, the more card advantage we generate and also the faster all of our opponents die. So we can give it Hexproof and Evasion with Fae Flight. We have uh, flexible uh, protection and removal spells with Decisive Denial. But the cutest spells are the ones that put stuff back on top of our opponent's library, which we can then uh, exile with Paco when we attack. So if somebody casts a non-creature spell that looks really tasty or is gonna take out Paco, we can counter it and then steal it with Paco, which is super fun, and then cast it uh, with Halden. 
And then the deck doesn't really take much to actually win the game. Paco gets huge all by itself, and eventually when our opponents don't have any more trump walkers, they're just gonna die. But we can speed up the process with stuff like Last Night Together, which is like a 25 cent way of taking an extra combat. Are you kidding me? And it makes them even bigger? Yeah, so this is great. Um, double the Paco triggers, grows Paco even more, doubles the damage output. Uh, we can give it double strike and trample with teamer battle range, so somebody just straight up dies and we can give it trample other ways too like cartouche of strength which gives it uh paco trample but also kills a creature in the process and yeah then everybody dies this is probably the strongest ten dollar brew you can come up with in my opinion so yeah the deck runs 68 lands but it doesn't matter because paco is so freaking strong it really doesn't matter this is actually I think the strongest $10 brew I've ever seen, but I guess the second one that we're coming up with next uh, might be a contender for the best one, actually. So our second $10 brew is Malcolm Keen-Eyed Navigator and Breach's Brazen Plunderer. Malcolm says, whenever one or more pirates you control deal damage to your opponents, you create a treasure token for each opponent dealt damage. So that's our mana generator. And Breach's says, whenever one or more pirates you control deal damage to your opponents, exile the top card of each of those opponents' libraries. You may play those cards this turn, and you may pay spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. So Breach's is our card advantage engine. We're stealing hopefully non-land cards from our opponents uh, to generate more card advantage and Malcolm is giving us a ton of treasures in the process as well. So this is a pirates deck. We want to be hitting our opponents with a bunch of pirates, uh, stealing their stuff, making a bunch of mana, and then either winning the game off their spells or we can actually win the game with various combos. And that's like the primary win condition of the deck. It's actually a sneaky combo deck that can also just win the game by just killing our opponents with their own spells. So early game, we just want to play a bunch of evasive pirates uh, that will trigger Malcolm and Breaches very efficiently. So the early games, we just play down our Siren Storm Tamers or whatever, the 1-1 one -one Flyers, you know, they'll come into play. Then we'll play Malcolm, we'll generate a bunch of ramp, and then we'll play Breaches and we'll not only generate a bunch of ramp, but we'll also uh, generate a bunch of card advantage. And then to win the game, we have various combos. We have a lot of creatures that ping each of our opponents. So Reckless Fireweaver and Ingenious Artillerist, both of these cards uh, say whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, it deals one damage to each opponent. So whenever Malcolm or your pirates are making treasures, uh, the Fireweaver and Artillerist are going to ping your opponents as that happens. Now that's already good by itself, but if we turn these creatures into pirates with cards like Image Crafter, suddenly this is an infinite combo because Malcolm doesn't say uh, when they deal combat damage, it's any type of damage. So for example, if Reckless Fireweaver is a pirate, whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under our control, the Fireweaver will deal one damage to each opponent, which will make us treasure tokens for each opponent damage this way, which will trigger the Reckless Fireweaver to deal more damage to each of our opponents, and it's an infinite damage loop. We make infinite treasures and we deal infinite damage. So this deck has a bunch of these type of pinger abilities and a bunch of ways of turning them to pirates, a lot of redundancy here, and that's just how we win the game. So I think I think either this deck or the Halden Paco deck are the two strongest $10 brews you can manage in Commander. Let me know if you know of any better $10 brews out there, but I think these are the most consistent ones. But we've got one more $10 theft deck. Um, it's Gaunti, Lord of Luxury. This is Mono Black Blink Theft. The idea here is that whenever uh, Gaunti enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of target opponent's library, exile one of them face down, and then put the rest on the bottom of that library in a random order. For as long as that card remains exiled, you may look at it, you may cast it, and you may spend mana on it as though it were mana of any type to cast it. So Gaunti has a very simple enter the battlefield, steal something from your opponent's deck, um, since we're running mostly lands in our deck, uh, we're hoping to find very powerful non-land cards in our opponent's decks and just cast those. And then the rest of the deck is just here to get more Enter the Battlefield triggers off Gaunti, keep using its ability to cast more spells off our opponent's decks. 
So Skull Collector can bounce Gaunti back to hand so we can recast it. Golden Argosi allows us to flicker Gaunti. And same thing with Rescue from the Underworld. We sacrifice Gaunti and then we return Gaunti to the battlefield along with another creature in our graveyard. Then the rest of the deck are other ways of casting our opponent's cards. Draugr Necromancer allows us to cast creatures off our opponents when they die. Intellect Devourer allows us to cast spells from our opponent's hands when they get exiled. In all their shadows, exile every opponent's graveyards, and then we get to cast a spell exiled this way. And also, Intellect Devourer and Author's Shadows are great Blink targets too, just like Gaunti. So this is Blink Theft. Um, it does a pretty good job of what it's trying to do. I would say the other two $10 Theft decks are much stronger. But the one thing going for this one is that it's going to fly under the radar. It's clearly not as strong as the other two. It has no instant I win combos or anything like that. So it'd be very odd if your opponents like focus this deck down or anything. And Gaunti is a death toucher too. So it can kind of, you know, hang around and everything. Maybe deter attacks. It dies. It doesn't matter if it dies. You just recast it or reanimate it or whatever. It's fine. It's chill. It's a very chill deck. All right, so those $10 decks were all theft decks, but we have one combo gimmick deck as well to show you that's $10. And that is Borborygmos Enraged. Now this is an expensive boy. It's eight mana, it's gruel. The first ability says, when it deals combat damage to a player, you reveal the top three cards of your library, put all land cards revealed this way into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. But the one that we actually care about is the Scarta land card, it deals three damage to target creature or player. That's the only ability we truly care about, the discarding to deal three damage to a creature or player. We're gonna turn that into an instant win by enchanting Borborygmos with either Keen Sense or Snake Umbra. Both of them do essentially the same thing. They say whenever a creature deals damage to an opponent, you may draw a card. It's not combat damage, it's any type of damage. So the idea here is very simple. We enchant Borborygmos with one of these two cards, and then we discard a land card from our hand, deal three damage to an opponent's face, that will trigger our enchantment and we'll draw a card, which will be another land. We'll discard that land, deal three damage, and we repeat this until all of our opponents are dead. It's very simple, but it does win the game on the spot. Now we have to find either Snake Umber or Keen Sense in order to win the game. So we have various ways of actually finding them a little bit easier. The best way to finding these cards is Abundance. We can play this before we play Borborygos and Rage and try to win the game. And then we just use this to keep drawing lands every single turn. And then on the turn we actually want to win the game, we can use this to make sure we draw a non-land card. Basically anything that will find uh, Keen Sense or Snake Umbra or just finding uh, the Umbra itself, then play Borborygos, play the enchantments, and win the game that way. And we can also utilize Cascade spells. The only non-land cards in the deck that have a mana value 3 or less are Keen Sense and Snake Umbra. So if we cast 4 mana value Cascade spells, like Throws of Chaos, they're guaranteed to hit uh, either Keen Sense or Snake Umbra. So Borborygos is a very slow combo because the commander itself is already eight mana. Um, so we're running every single land in the deck uh, that can fit our budget that can tap for two or more mana. So we're running like depletion lands like Hick Hickory Woodlot, which can be tapped for two mana instead of just one. We have like Temple of the False God, which can be tapped for two mana instead of just one. So I think that that can get Borborygmos out like as early as like turn five, maybe even turn four. I'm not quite sure which is still not fast, but it is way better than turn eight, right? So the deck is a gimmick deck. It is very much not good. It folds to any sort of interaction and you're not gonna be doing anything until like turn five or six. So yeah, it's not good. But if your opponents just let you do your thing, you just play Borborygmos and then your enchantment and then you just win the game. So I guess that's good. But yeah, it's a $10 deck and it's not a theft deck. It's a gimmick all-in one-shot combo deck, which is pretty cool, I think. It's, it's worth $10 just for the entertainment value of catching your opponents unaware and having a cool story about it later. 
So yeah, those were my decks, 25 decks under $25, including four of those decks being $10 brews. This video took a very, very long time to complete. I had to make a lot of decks from scratch. I only updated a handful of them uh, to put them down to $25. And I also play tested a whole bunch of these decks as well too, to make sure they were as good as they possibly can be for their $25 price tag. So if you know anybody who's interested in budget brews, please share this video, share the article as well. You can find all the deck lists in the article uh, that's going to be in the video description as well. Like and subscribe if you like this sort of stuff. And until next time, friends, see ya!